Book seven, chapters eighteen through thirty five of the City of God. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo, Book seven, chapter eighteen. A far more credible account of these gods is given when it is said that they were men, and that to each one of them sacred rites and solemnities were instituted according to his particular genius, manners, actions, circumstances, which rites and solemnities, by gradually creeping through the souls of men which are like demons, and eager for things which yield them sport, were spread far and wide, the poets adorning them with lies and false spirits seducing men to receive them. For it is far more likely that some youth, either impious himself or afraid of being slain by an impious father, being desirous to reign, dethroned his father, than that, according to Varro's interpretation, Saturn was overthrown by his son Jupiter. For cause which belongs to Jupiter is before seed which belongs to Saturn. For had this been so, Saturn would never have been before Jupiter, nor would he have been the father of Jupiter. For cause always precedes seed, and is never generated from seed. But when they seek to honour by natural interpretation most vain fables or deeds of men, even the acutest men are so perplexed that we are compelled to grieve for their folly also. CHAPTER Nineteen. They said, says Vara, that Saturn was wont to devour all that sprang from him, because seeds returned to the earth from whence they sprang. And when it is said that a lump of earth was put before Saturn to be devoured instead of Jupiter, it is signified, he says, that before the art of ploughing was discovered, seeds were buried in the earth by the hands of men. The earth itself, then, and not seeds, should have been called Saturn, because it in a manner devours what it has brought forth, when the seeds which have sprung from it return again into it. And what has Saturn's receiving of a lump of earth, instead of Jupiter, to do with this, that the seeds were covered in the soil by the hands of men? Was the seed kept from being devoured, like other things, by being covered with the soil? For what they say would imply that he who put on the soil took away the seed, as Jupiter is said to have been taken away when the lump of soil was offered to Saturn instead of him, and not rather that the soil, by covering the seed, only caused it to be devoured more eagerly. Then, in that way, Jupiter is the seed, and not the cause of the seed, as was said a little before. But what shall men do who cannot find anything wise to say, because they are interpreting foolish things? Saturn has a pruning knife. That, says Varro, is on account of agriculture. Certainly, in Saturn's reign there has yet existed no agriculture, and therefore the former times of Saturn are spoken of, because, as the same Varro interprets the fables, the primeval man lived on those seeds which the earth produced spontaneously. Perhaps he received a pruning knife when he had lost his scepter, that he who had been a king and lived at ease during the first part of his time should become a laborious workman whilst his son occupied the throne. Then he says that boys were wont to be immolated to him by certain peoples, the Carthaginians, for instance, and also that adults were immolated by some nations, for example the Gauls, because of all seeds the human race is the best. What need we say more concerning this most cruel vanity? Let us rather attend to and hold by this, that these interpretations are not carried up to the true God, a living, incorporeal, unchangeable nature, from whom a blessed life enduring for ever may be obtained, but that they end in things which are corporeal, temporal, mutable, and mortal. And whereas it is said in the fables that Saturn castrated his father Chelus, this signifies, says Varro, that the divine seed belongs to Saturn and not to Chelus. For this reason, as far as a reason can be discovered, namely that in heaven nothing is born from seed. But lo, Saturn, if he is the son of Chelus, is the son of Jupiter. For they affirm times without number, and that emphatically, that the heavens are Jupiter. Thus those things which come not of the truth do very often, without being impelled by any one, themselves overthrow one another. He says that Saturn was called Kronos, which in the Greek tongue signifies a space of time, because without that seed cannot be productive. These and many other things are said concerning Saturn, and they are all referred to seed. But Saturn surely, with all that great power, might have sufficed for seed. Why are other gods demanded for it, especially Liber and Libera, that is, Ceres, concerning whom again, as far as seed is concerned, he says as many things as if he had said nothing concerning Saturn? Chapter 20 
Now among the rites of Ceres, those Eleusinian rites are much famed which were in the highest repute among the Athenians, of which Varro offers no interpretation except with respect to corn, which Ceres discovered, and with respect to Proserpine, whom Ceres lost, Orcus having carried her away. And this Proserpine herself, he says, signifies the fecundity of seeds. But as this fecundity departed at a certain season, whilst the earth wore an aspect of sorrow through the consequent sterility, there arose an opinion that the daughter of Ceres, that is, fecundity itself, who was called Proserpine, from Proserpere, to creep forth to spring, had been carried away by Orcus and detained among the inhabitants of the nether world, which circumstance was celebrated with public mourning. But since the same fecundity again returned, there arose joy because Proserpine had been given back by Orcus, and thus these rites were instituted. Then Varro adds that many things are taught in the mysteries of Ceres, which only refer to the discovery of fruits. Chapter 21 now as to the rites of Liber, whom they have set over liquid seeds, and therefore not only over the liquors of fruits, among which wine holds, so to speak, the primacy, but also over the seeds of animals. As to these rites, I am unwilling to undertake to show to what excess of turpitude they had reached, because that would entail a lengthened discourse, though I am not unwilling to do so as a demonstration of the proud stupidity of those who practised them. Among other rites which I am compelled from the greatness of their number to omit, Varro says that in Italy, at the places where roads crossed each other, the rites of Liber were celebrated with such unrestrained turpitude that the private parts of a man were worshipped in his honour. Nor was this abomination transacted in secret, that some regard at least might be paid to modesty, but was openly and wantonly displayed. For during the festival of Liber, this obscene member, placed on a car, was carried with great honour, first over the cross-roads in the country, and then into the city. But in the town of Lavinium a whole month was devoted to Liber alone, during the days of which all the people gave themselves up to the most dissolute conversation, until that member had been carried through the forum and brought to rest in its own place, on which unseemly member it was necessary that the most honourable matron should place a wreath in the presence of all the people. Thus, forsooth, was the god Liber to be appeased in order to the growth of seeds. Thus was enchantment to be driven away from fields, even by a matron's being compelled to do in public what not even a harlot ought to be permitted to do in a theatre, if there were matrons among the spectators. For these reasons, then, Saturn alone was not believed to be sufficient for seeds, namely that the impure mind might find occasions for multiplying the gods, and that, being righteously abandoned to uncleanness by the one true god, and being prostituted to the worship of many false gods through an avidity for ever greater and greater uncleanness, it should call these sacrilegious rites sacred things, and should abandon itself to be violated and polluted by crowds of foul demons. CHAPTER Twenty Two. Now Neptune had Celestia to wife, who they say is the nether waters of the sea. Wherefore was Vanilia also joined to him? Was it not simply through the lust of the soul, desiring a greater number of demons to whom to prostitute itself, and not because this goddess was necessary to the perfection of their sacred rites? But let the interpretation of this illustrious theology be brought forward to restrain us from this censuring by rendering a satisfactory reason. Vanilia, says this theology, is the wave which comes to the shore, Salacia the wave which returns into the sea. Why, then, are there two goddesses, when it is one wave which comes and returns? Certainly it is mad lust itself, which in its eagerness for many deities resembles the waves which break on the shore. For though the water which goes is not different from that which returns, still the soul which goes and returns not is defiled by two demons, whom it has taken occasion by this false pretext to invite. I ask thee, O Varro, and you who have read such works of learned men, and think ye have learned something great, I ask you to interpret this, I do not say in a manner consistent with the eternal and unchangeable nature which alone is God, but only in a manner consistent with the doctrine concerning the soul of the world and its parts, which ye think to be the true gods. It is a somewhat more tolerable thing that ye have made that part of the soul of the world which pervades the sea your god Neptune. Is the wave, then, which comes to the shore and returns to the main, two parts of the world, or two parts of the soul of the world? Who of you is so silly as to think so? Why, then, have they made to you two goddesses? The only reason seems to be that your wise ancestors have provided, not that many gods should rule you, but that many of such demons as are delighted with those vanities and falsehoods should possess you. But why has that Salacia, according to this interpretation, lost to the lower part of the sea, seeing that she was represented as subject to her husband? For in saying that she is the receding wave, ye have put her on the surface. Was she enraged at her husband for taking Vanilia as a concubine, and thus drove him from the upper part of the sea? Chapter 23 
Surely the earth, which we see full of its own living creatures, is one, but for all that it is but a mighty mass among the elements in the lowest part of the world. Why then would they have it to be a goddess? Is it because it is fruitful? Why then are not men rather held to be gods who render it fruitful by cultivating it? But though they plough it, do not adore it. But, they say, the part of the soul of the world which pervades it makes it a goddess. As if it were not a far more evident thing, nay, a thing which is not called in question, that there is a soul in man. And yet men are not held to be gods, but, a thing to be sadly lamented, with wonderful and pitiful delusion are subjected to those who are not gods, and then whom they themselves are better as the objects of deserved worship and adoration. And certainly the same Varro, in the book concerning the select gods, affirms that there are three grades of soul in universal nature one which pervades all the living parts of the body, and has not sensation, but only the power of life, that principle which penetrates into the bones, nails, and hair. By this principle in the world trees are nourished, and grow without being possessed of sensation, and live in a manner peculiar to themselves. The second grade of soul is that in which there is sensation. This principle penetrates into the eyes, ears, nostrils, mouth, and the organs of sensation. The third grade of soul is the highest, and is called mind, where intelligence has its throne. This grade of soul no mortal creatures except man are possessed of. Now this part of the soul of the world, Varro says, is called God, and in us is called genius. And the stones and earth in the world which we see, and which are not pervaded by the power of sensation, are, as it were, the bones and nails of God. Again, the sun, moon, and stars which we perceive, and by which he perceives, are his organs of perception. Moreover, the ether is his mind, and by the virtue which is in it, which penetrates into the stars, it also makes them gods, and because it penetrates through them into the earth, it makes it the goddess Tellus, whence again it enters and permeates the sea and ocean, making them the god Neptune. Let him return from this, which he thinks to be natural theology, back to that from which he went out, in order to rest from the fatigue occasioned by the many turnings and windings of his path. Let him return, I say, let him return to the civil theology. I wish to detain him there a while. I have somewhat to say which has to do with that theology. I am not yet saying that if the earth and stones are similar to our bones and nails, they are in like manner devoid of intelligence as they are devoid of sensation. Nor am I saying that if our bones and nails are said to have intelligence, because they are in a man who has intelligence, he who says that the things analogous to these in the world are gods is as stupid as he is who says that our bones and nails are men. We shall perhaps have occasion to dispute these things with the philosophers. At present, however, I wish to deal with Varro as a political theologian, for it is possible that though he may seem to have wished to lift up his head, as it were, into the liberty of natural theology, the consciousness that the book with which he was occupied was one concerning a subject belonging to civil theology may have caused him to relapse into the point of view of that theology, and to say this in order that the ancestors of his nation and other states might not be believed to have bestowed on Neptune an irrational worship. What I am to say is this. Since the earth is one, why has not that part of the soul of the world which permeates the earth made it that one goddess which he calls Tellus? But had it done so, what then had become of Orcus, the brother of Jupiter and Neptune, whom they call Father Dis? And where, in that case, had been his wife Proserpine, who, according to another opinion given in the same book, is called not the fecundity of the earth, but its lower part? But if they say that part of the soul of the world, when it permeates the upper part of the earth, makes the god Father Dis, but when it pervades the nether part of the same, the goddess Proserpine, what in that case will that Telus be? For all that which she was has been divided into these two parts and these two gods, so that it is impossible to find what to make or where to place her as a third goddess, except it be said that those divinities Orcus and Proserpine are the one goddess Telos, and that they are not three gods, but one or two, whilst notwithstanding they are called three, held to be three, worshipped as three, having their own several altars, their own shrines, rites, images, priests, whilst their own false demons also through these things defile the prostituted soul. Let this further question be answered. What part of the earth does a part of the soul of the world permeate in order to make the god Telumo? No, says he, but the earth being one and the same has a double life, the masculine which produces seed, and the feminine which receives and nourishes the seed. Hence it has been called Telus from the feminine principle, and Telumo from the masculine. Why then do the priests, as he indicates, perform divine service to four gods, two others being added, namely to Telus, Telumo, Altor, and Rusor? We have already spoken concerning Tellus and Telumo. But why do they worship Altor? Because, says he, all that springs of the earth is nourished by the earth. 
Wherefore do they worship Rusor? Because all things were turned back again to the place whence they proceeded. Chapter 24 The one earth, then, on account of this fourfold virtue, ought to have had four surnames, but not to have been considered as four gods. As Jupiter and Juno, though they have so many surnames, are for all that only single deities. For by all these surnames it is signified that a manifold virtue belongs to one god or to one goddess, but the multitude of surnames does not imply a multitude of gods. But as sometimes even the vilest women themselves grow tired of those crowds which they have sought after under the impulse of wicked passion, so also the soul, become vile and prostituted to impure spirits, sometimes begins to loathe and multiply to itself gods to whom to surrender itself to be polluted by them, as much as it once delighted in so doing. For Varro himself, as if ashamed of that crowd of gods, would make Tellus to be one goddess. They say, says he, that whereas the one great mother has a tympanum, it is signified that she is the orb of the earth, whereas she has towers on her head, towns are signified, and whereas seats are fixed round about her, it is signified that whilst all things move, she moves not. And their having made the galli to serve this goddess signifies that they who are in need of seed ought to follow the earth, for in it all seeds are found. By their throwing themselves down before her, it is taught, he says, that they who cultivate the earth should not sit idle, for there is always something for them to do. The sound of the cymbal signifies the noise made by the throwing of iron utensils, and by men's hands, and all other noises connected with agricultural operations. And these cymbals are of brass, because the ancients used brazen utensils in their agriculture before iron was discovered. They place beside the goddess an unbound and tame lion, to show that there is no kind of land so wild and so excessively barren, as that it would be profitless to attempt to bring it in and cultivate it. Then he adds that because they gave many names and surnames to Mother Tellus, it came to be thought that these signified many gods. They think, says he, that Tellus is ops because the earth is improved by labor, Mother because it brings forth much, Great because it brings forth seed, Proserpine because fruits creep forth from it, Vesta because it is invested with herbs. And thus, says he, they not at all absurdly identify other goddesses with the earth. If, then, it is one goddess, though if the truth were consulted it is not even that, why do they nevertheless separate it into many? Let there be many names of one goddess, and let there not be as many goddesses as there are names. But the authority of the erring ancients weighs heavily on Varro, and compels him, after having expressed this opinion, to show signs of uneasiness, for he immediately adds, With which things the opinion of the ancients, who thought that there were really many goddesses, does not conflict? How does it not conflict, when it is entirely a different thing to say that one goddess has many names, and to say that there are many goddesses? But it is possible, he says, that the same thing may both be one, and yet have in it a plurality of things. I grant that there are many things in one man. Are there therefore in him many men? In like manner, in one goddess there are many things. Are there therefore also many goddesses? But let them divide, unite, multiply, reduplicate, and implicate as they like. These are the famous mysteries of Telos and the Great Mother, all of which are shown to have reference to mortal seeds and to agriculture. To these things, then, namely the tepanum, the towers, the galli, the tossing to and fro of limbs, the noise of cymbals, the images of lions, do these things, having this reference and this end, promise eternal life? Do the mutilated galli, then, serve this Great Mother in order to signify that they who are in need of seed should follow the earth, as though it were not rather the case that this very service caused them to want seed? For what do they, by following this goddess, acquire seed, being in want of it, or by following her lose seed when they have it? Is this to interpret, or to deprecate? Nor is it considered to what a degree malign demons have gained the upper hand, inasmuch as they have been able to exact such cruel rites without having dared to promise any great things in return for them. Had the earth not been a goddess, men would have, by labouring, laid their hands on it in order to obtain seed through it, and would not have laid violent hands on themselves in order to lose seed on account of it. Had it not been a goddess, it would have become so fertile by the hands of others, that it would not have compelled a man to be rendered barren by his own hands. Nor that in the festival of Liber an honourable matron put a wreath on the private parts of a man in the sight of the multitude, where perhaps her husband was standing by blushing and perspiring, if there is any shame left in men, and that in the celebration of marriages the newly married bride was ordered to sit upon Priapus. 
These things are bad enough, but they are small and contemptible in comparison with that most cruel abomination, or most abominable cruelty, by which either set is so deluded that neither perishes of its wound. There the enchantment of fields is feared, here the amputation of members is not feared. There the modesty of the bride is outraged, but in such a manner as that neither her fruitfulness nor even her virginity is taken away. Here a man is so mutilated that he is neither changed into a woman nor remains a man. Chapter 25 Varro has not spoken of that Attis, nor sought out any interpretation for him, in memory of whose being loved by Ceres the gallus is mutilated. But the learned and wise Greeks have by no means been silent about an interpretation so holy and so illustrious. The celebrated philosopher Porphyry has said that Attis signifies the flowers of spring, which is the most beautiful season, and therefore was mutilated because the flower falls before the fruit appears. They have not then compared the man himself, or rather that semblance of a man they called Attis to the flower, but his male organs. These indeed fell whilst he was living. Uh, did I say fell? Nay, truly, they did not fall, nor were they plucked off, but torn away. Nor when that flower was lost did any fruit follow, but rather a sterility. What then do they say is signified by the castrated Attis himself, and whatever remained to him after his castration? To what do they refer that? What interpretation does that give rise to? Do they, after vain endeavours to discover an interpretation, seek to persuade men that that is rather to be believed which report has been made public, and which also has been written concerning his having been a mutilated man? Arvarov has very properly opposed this, and has been unwilling to state it, for it certainly was not unknown to that most learned man. CHAPTER Twenty Six. Concerning the effeminates consecrated to the same great mother, in defiance of all the modesty which belongs to men and women, Varro has not wished to say anything, nor do I remember to have read anywhere aught concerning them. These effeminates, no later than yesterday, were going through the streets and places of Carthage with anointed hair, whitened faces, relaxed bodies, and feminine gait, exacting from the people the means of maintaining their ignominious lives. Nothing has been said concerning them. Interpretation failed, reason blushed, speech was silent. The great mother has surpassed all her sons, not in greatness of deity, but of crime. To this monster not even the monstrosity of Janus is to be compared. His deformity was only in his image, hers was the deformity of cruelty in her sacred rites. He has a redundancy of members in stone images, she inflicts the loss of members on men. This abomination is not surpassed by the licentious deeds of Jupiter, so many and so great. He, with all his seductions of women, only disgraced heaven with one Ganymede. She, with so many avowed and public effeminates, has both defiled the earth and outraged heaven. Perhaps we may either compare Saturn to this mania mater, or even set him before her in this kind of abominable cruelty, for he mutilated his father. But at the festivals of Saturn men could rather be slain by the hands of others than mutilated by their own. He devoured his sons, as the poets say, and the natural theologists interpret this as they list. History says he slew them. But the Romans have never received, like the Carthaginians, the custom of sacrificing their sons to him. This great mother of the gods, however, has brought mutilated men into Roman temples, and has preserved that cruel custom, being believed to promote the strength of the Romans by emasculating their men. Compared with this evil, what are the thefts of Mercury, the wantonness of Venus, and the base and flagitious deeds of the rest of them, which we might bring forward from books, were it not that they are daily sung and danced in the theatres? But what are those things to so great an evil, an evil whose magnitude was only proportioned to the greatness of the great mother, especially as these are said to have been invented by the poets, as if the poets had also invented this, that they are acceptable to the gods? Let it be imputed, then, to the audacity and impudence of the poets that these things have been sung and written of, but that they have been incorporated into the body of divine rights and honours, the deities themselves demanding and extorting that incorporation, what is that but the crime of the gods, nay more the confession of demons and the deception of wretched men? But as to this, that the great mother is considered to be worshipped in the appropriate form when she is worshipped by the consecration of mutilated men, this is not an invention of the poets, nay, they have rather shrunk from it with horror than sung of it. Ought any one, then, to be consecrated to these select gods, that he may live blessedly after death, consecrated to whom he could not live decently before death, being subjected to such foul superstitions, and bound over to unclean demons? But all these things, said Varro, are to be referred to the world. Let him consider if it be not rather to the unclean. But why not refer that to the world which is demonstrated to be in the world? 
We, however, seek for a mind which, trusting to true religion, does not adore the world as its God, but for the sake of God praises the world as a work of God, and purified from mundane defilements, comes pure to God himself who founded the world. Chapter 27 we see that these select gods have indeed become more famous than the rest, not, however, that their merits may be brought to light, but that their opprobrious deeds may not be hid. Whence it is more credible that they were men, as not only poetic, but also historical literature has handed down. For this which Virgil says, Then from Olympus' heights came down good Saturn, exiled from his throne by Jove, his mightier heir and what follows with reference to this affair is fully related by the historian Euhemerus, and has been translated into Latin by Aeneas. And as they have written before us in the Greek or in the Latin tongue, against such errors as these, have said much concerning this matter, I have thought it unnecessary to dwell upon it. When I consider those physical reasons, then, by which learned and acute men attempt to turn human things into divine things, all I see is that they have been able to refer these things only to temporal works, and to that which has a corporeal nature, and even though invisible, still mutable, and this is by no means the true God. But if this worship had been performed as the symbolism of ideas at least congruous with the religion, though it would indeed have been cause of grief that the true God was not announced and proclaimed by its symbolism, nevertheless it could have been in some degree borne with, when it did not occasion and command the performance of such foul and abominable things. But since it is impiety to worship the body or the soul for the true God, by whose indwelling alone the soul is happy, how much more impious is it to worship those things through which neither soul nor body can obtain either salvation or human honor? Wherefore, if with temple, priest, and sacrifice, which are due to the true God, any element of the world be worshipped, or any created spirit, even though not impure and evil, that worship is still evil, not because the things are evil by which the worship is performed, but because those things ought only to be used in the worship of him to whom alone such worship and service are due. But if any one insists that he worships the one true God, that is, the creator of every soul and of every body, with stupid and monstrous idols, with human victims, with putting a wreath on the male organ, with the wages of unchastity, with the cutting of limbs, with emasculation, with the consecration of effeminates, with impure and obscene plays, such a one does not sin because he worships one who ought not to be worshipped, but because he worships him who ought to be worshipped in a way in which he ought not to be worshipped. But he who worships with such things, that is, foul and obscene things, and that not the true God, namely the maker of soul and body, but a creature, even though not a wicked creature, whether it be soul or body, or soul and body together, twice sins against God, because he both worships for God what is not God, and also worships with such things as neither God nor what is not God ought to be worshipped with. It is indeed manifest how these pagans worship, that is, how shamefully and criminally they worship, but what or whom they worship would have been left in obscurity, had not their history testified that those same confessedly base and foul rites were rendered in obedience to the demands of the gods who exacted them with terrible severity. Wherefore it is evident beyond doubt that this whole civil theology is occupied in inventing means for attracting wicked and most impure spirits, inviting them to visit senseless images, and through these to take possession of stupid hearts. CHAPTER Twenty Eight. To what purpose, then, is it that this most learned and most acute man Varro attempts, as it were, with subtle disputation, to reduce and refer all these gods to heaven and earth? He cannot do it. They go out of his hands like water. They shrink back. They slip down and fall. For when about to speak of the females, that is, the goddesses, he says, Since, as I observed in the first book concerning places, heaven and earth are the two origins of the gods, on which account they are called celestials and terrestrials, and, as I began in the former books with heaven, speaking of Janus, whom some have said to be heaven, and others the earth, so I now commence with Tellus in speaking concerning the goddesses. I can understand what embarrassment so great a mind was experiencing, for he is influenced by the perception of a certain plausible resemblance when he says that the heaven is that which does, and the earth that which suffers, and therefore attributes the masculine principle to the one, and the feminine to the other, not considering that it is rather he who made both heaven and earth who is the maker of both activity and passivity. On this principle he interprets the celebrated mysteries of the Samothracians, and promises with an air of great devoutness that he will by writing expound these mysteries, which have not been so much as known to his countrymen, and will send them his exposition. 
Then he says that he had from many proofs gathered that in those mysteries, among the images one signifies heaven, another the earth, another the patterns of things, which Plato calls ideas. He makes Jupiter to signify heaven, Juno the earth, Minerva the ideas. Heaven by which anything is made, the earth from which it is made, and the pattern according to which it is made. But with respect to the last, I am forgetting to say that Plato attributed so great an importance to these ideas as to say, not that anything was made by heaven according to them, but that according to them heaven itself was made. To return, however, it is to be observed that Varro has, in the book on the select gods, lost that theory of these gods, in whom he has, as it were, embraced all things. For he assigns the male gods to heaven, the females to earth, among which latter he has placed Minerva, whom he had before placed above heaven itself. Then the male god Neptune is in the sea, which pertains rather to earth than to heaven. Last of all, Father Dis, who is called in Greek Pluton, another male god, brother of both Jupiter and Neptune, is also held to be a god of the earth, holding the upper region of the earth himself, and allotting the nether region to his wife Proserpine. How then did they attempt to refer the gods to heaven, and the goddesses to earth? What solidity, what consistency, what sobriety has this disputation? But that Tellus is the origin of the goddesses, the great mother to wit, beside whom there is continually the noise of the mad and abominable reverie of effeminates and mutilated men, and men who cut themselves and indulge in frantic gesticulations. How is it, then, that Janus is called the head of the gods, and Tellus the head of the goddesses? In the one case error does not make one head, and in the other frenzy does not make a sane one. Why do they vainly attempt to refer these to the world? Even if they could do so, no pious person worships the world for the true God. Nevertheless, plain truth makes it evident that they are not able even to do this. Let them rather identify them with dead men and most wicked demons, and no further question will remain. Chapter 29 for all those things which, according to the account given of those gods, are referred to the world by so-called physical interpretation, may, without any religious scruple, be rather assigned to the true God, who made heaven and earth, and created every soul and every body. And the following is the manner in which we see that this may be done. We worship God, not heaven and earth, of which two parts this world consists, nor the soul or souls diffused through all living things, but God, who made heaven and earth, and all things which are in them, who made every soul, whatever be the nature of its life, whether it have life without sensation and reason, or life with sensation, or life with both sensation and reason. CHAPTER thirty. And now to begin to go over those works of the one true God, on account of which these have made to themselves many and false gods, whilst they attempt to give an honourable interpretation to their many most abominable and most infamous mysteries, we worship that God who is appointed to the natures created by him, both the beginnings and the end of their existing and moving, who holds, knows, and disposes the causes of things, who hath created the virtue of seeds, who hath given to what creatures he would a rational soul which is called mind, who hath bestowed the faculty and use of speech, who hath imparted the gift of foretelling future things to whatever spirits it seemed to him good, who also himself predicts future things, through whom he pleases, and through whom he will, removes diseases who, when the human race is to be corrected and chastised by wars, regulates also the beginnings, progress, and ends of these wars, who hath created and governs the most vehement and most violent fire of this world, in due relation and proportion to the other elements of immense nature, who is the governor of all the waters, who hath made the sun brightest of all material lights, and hath given him suitable power and motion, who hath not withdrawn even from the inhabitants of the nether world his dominion and power, who hath appointed to mortal natures their suitable seed and nourishment, dry or liquid, who establishes and makes fruitful the earth, who bestows bountifully its fruits on animals and on men, who knows and ordains not only principal causes, but also subsequent causes, who hath determined for the moon her motion, who affords ways in heaven and on earth for passage from one place to another, who hath granted also to human minds which he hath created not the knowledge of the various arts for the help of life and nature, who hath appointed the union of male and female for the propagation of offspring, who hath favoured the societies of men with the gift of terrestrial fire, for the simplest and most familiar purposes, to burn on the hearth and to give light. 
These are, then, the things which that most acute and most learned man Varro has laboured to distribute among the select gods, by I know not what physical interpretation, which he has got from other sources, and also conjectured for himself. But these things the one true God makes and does, but as the same God, that is, as he who is holy everywhere, included in no space, bound by no chains, mutable in no part of his being, filling heaven and earth with omnipresent power, not with a needy nature. Therefore he governs all things in such a manner as to allow them to perform and exercise their own proper movements. For although they can be nothing without him, they are not what he is. He does also many things through angels, but only from himself does he beatify angels. So also, though he sent angels to men for certain purposes, he does not for all that beatify men by the good inherent in the angels, but by himself, as he does the angels themselves. CHAPTER Thirty One. For besides such benefits, as according to this administration of nature, of which we have made some mention, he lavishes on good and bad alike, we have from him a great manifestation of great love which belongs only to the good. For although we can never sufficiently give thanks to him, that we are, that we live, that we behold heaven and earth, that we have mind and reason by which to seek after him who made all these things, nevertheless what hearts, what number of tongues shall affirm that they are sufficient to render thanks to him for this, that he hath not wholly departed from us, laden and overwhelmed with sins, averse to the contemplation of his light, and blinded by the love of darkness, that is, of iniquity, but hath sent to us his own word, who is his only Son, that by his birth and suffering for us in the flesh, which he assumed, we might know how much God valued man, and that by that unique sacrifice we might be purified from all our sins, and that, love being shed abroad in our hearts by his Spirit, we might, having surmounted all difficulties, come into eternal rest, and the ineffable sweetness of the contemplation of himself. CHAPTER Thirty Two. This mystery of eternal life, even from the beginning of the human race, was, by certain signs and sacraments suitable to the times, announced through angels to those to whom it was meet. Then the Hebrew people was congregated into one republic, as it were, to perform this mystery, and in that republic was foretold, sometimes through men who understood what they spake, and sometimes through men who understood not, all that had transpired since the advent of Christ until now, and all that will transpire. This same nation, too, was afterwards dispersed through the nations in order to testify to the scriptures in which eternal salvation in Christ had been declared. For not only the prophecies which are contained in words, nor only the precepts for the right conduct of life, which teach morals and piety, and are contained in the sacred writings, not only these, but also the rites, priesthood, tabernacle or temple, altars, sacrifices, ceremonies, and whatever else belongs to that service which is due to God, and which in Greek is properly called Latreia, all these signified and foreannounced those things which we who believe in Jesus Christ and to eternal life believe to have been fulfilled, or behold in process of fulfillment, or confidently believe shall yet be fulfilled. CHAPTER Thirty Three. This, the only true religion, has alone been able to manifest that the gods of the nations are most impure demons, who desire to be thought gods, availing themselves of the names of certain defunct souls, or the appearance of mundane creatures, and with proud impurity rejoicing in things most base and infamous, as though in divine honours, and envying human souls their conversion to the true God from whose most cruel and most impious dominion a man is liberated when he believes on him who is afforded an example of humility, following which men may rise as great as was that pride by which they fell. Hence are not only those gods, concerning whom we have already spoken much, and many others belonging to different nations and lands, but also those of whom we are now treating, who have been selected, as it were, into the senate of the gods, selected, however, on account of the notoriousness of their crimes, not on account of the dignity of their virtues, whose sacred things Varro attempts to refer to certain natural reasons, seeking to make base things honourable, but cannot find how to square and agree with these reasons, because these are not the causes of those rights which he thinks, or rather wishes to be thought to be so. For had not only these, but also all others of this kind, been real causes, even though they had nothing to do with the true God and eternal life, which is to be sought in religion, they would, by affording some sort of reason drawn from the nature of things, have mitigated in some degree that offence which was occasioned by some turpitude or absurdity in the sacred rites, which was not understood. This he attempted to do in respect to certain fables of the theatres, or mysteries of the shrines, but he did not acquit the theatres of likeness to the shrines, but rather condemn the shrines for likeness to the theatres. 
However, he in some way made the attempt to soothe the feelings shocked by horrible things, by rendering what he would have to be natural interpretations. CHAPTER Thirty Four. But, on the other hand, we find, as the same most learned man has related, that the causes of the sacred rites which were given from the books of Numa Pompilius could by no means be tolerated, and were considered unworthy, not only to become known to the religious by being read, but even to lie written in the darkness in which they had been concealed. For now let me say what I promised in the third book of this work to say in its proper place. For as we read in the same Varro's book on the worship of the gods, a certain one Terentius had a field at the Janiculum, and once, when his ploughman was passing the plough near to the tomb of Numa Pompilius, he turned up from the ground the books of Numa, in which were written the causes of the sacred institutions, which books he carried to the praetor, who, having read the beginnings of them, referred to the senate what seemed to be a matter of so much importance. And when the chief senators had read certain of the causes why this or that rite was instituted, the senate assented to the dead Numa, and the conscript fathers, as though concerned for the interests of religion, and ordered the praetor to burn the books. Let each one believe what he thinks, nay, let every champion of such impiety say whatever mad contention may suggest. For my part, let it suffice to suggest that the causes of those sacred things which were written down by King Numa Pompilius, the institutor of the Roman rites, ought never to have become known to people or senate, or even to the priests themselves, and also that Numa himself attained to these secrets of demons by an illicit curiosity, in order that he might write them down, so as to be able by reading to be reminded of them. However, though he was king, and had no cause to be afraid of any one, he neither dared to teach them to any one, nor to destroy them by obliteration, or any other form of destruction. Therefore, because he was unwilling that any one should know them, lest men should be taught infamous things, and because he was afraid to violate them, lest he should enrage the demons against himself, he buried them in what he thought a safe place, believing that a plough could not approach his sepulchre. But the Senate, fearing to condemn the religious solemnities of their ancestors, and therefore compelled to assent to Numa, were nevertheless so convinced that those books were pernicious, that they did not order them to be buried again, knowing that human curiosity would thereby be excited to seek with far greater eagerness after the matter already divulged, but ordered the scandalous relics to be destroyed with fire. Because, as they thought it was now a necessity to perform those sacred rites, they judged that the error arising from ignorance of their causes was more tolerable than the disturbance which the knowledge of them would occasion the state. Chapter 35 For Numa himself also, to whom no prophet of God, no holy angel was sent, was driven to have recourse to hydromancy, that he might see the images of the gods in the water, or rather appearances whereby the demons made sport of him, and might learn from them what he ought to ordain and observe in the sacred rites. This kind of divination, says Varro, was introduced by the Persians, and was used by Numa himself, and at an after-time by the philosopher Pythagoras. In this divination, he says, they also inquire at the inhabitants of the nether world, and make use of blood, and this the Greeks call necromanteion. But whether it be called necromancy or hydromancy, it is the same thing, for in either case the dead are supposed to foretell future things. But by what artifices these things are done, let themselves consider. For I am unwilling to say that these artifices were wont to be prohibited by the laws, and to be very severely punished even in the Gentile states, before the advent of our Saviour. I am unwilling, I say, to affirm this, for perhaps even such things were then allowed. However, it was by these arts that Pompilius learned those sacred rites which he gave forth as facts, whilst he concealed their causes, for even he himself was afraid of that which he had learned. The Senate also caused the books in which those causes were recorded to be burned. What is it, then, to me, that Varro attempts to adduce all sorts of fanciful physical interpretations, which if these books had contained, they would certainly not have been burned? For otherwise the conscript fathers would also have burned those books which Varro published and dedicated to the high priest Caesar. Now Numa is said to have married the Nymphagaria, because, as Varro explains it in the forementioned book, he carried forth water wherewith to perform his hydromancy. Thus facts are wont to be converted into fables through false colorings. It was by that hydromancy, then, that that over-curious Roman king learned both the sacred rites which were to be written in the books of the priests, and also the causes of those rites, which latter, however, he was unwilling that any one besides himself should know. Wherefore he made these causes, as it were, to die along with himself, taking care to have them written by themselves, and removed from the knowledge of men by being buried in the earth. 
Wherefore the things which are written in those books were either abominations of demons, so foul and noxious, as to render that whole civil theology execrable, even in the eyes of such men as those senators, who had accepted so many shameful things in the sacred rites themselves, or they were nothing else than the accounts of dead men, whom through the lapse of ages almost all the Gentile nations had come to believe to be immortal gods, whilst those same demons were delighted even with such rites, having presented themselves to receive worship under pretense of being those very dead men whom they had caused to be thought immortal gods by certain fallacious miracles performed in order to establish that belief. But by the hidden providence of the true God these demons were permitted to confess these things to their friend Numa, having been gained by those arts through which necromancy could be performed, and yet were not constrained to admonish him rather at his death to burn than to bury the books in which they were written. But in order that these books might be unknown, the demons could not resist the plough by which they were thrown up, or the pen of Varro, through which the things that were done in reference to this matter have come down even to our knowledge. For they are not able to effect anything which they are not allowed, but they are permitted to influence those whom God, in his deep and just judgment, according to their deserts, gives over either to be simply afflicted by them, or to be also subdued and deceived. But how pernicious these writings were judged to be, or how alien from the worship of the true divinity, may be understood from the fact that the Senate preferred to burn what Pompilius had hid, rather than to fear what he feared, so that he could not dare to do that. Wherefore let him who does not desire to live a pious life even now seek eternal life by means of such rites. But let him who does not wish to have fellowship with malign demons have no fear for the noxious superstition wherewith they are worshipped, but let him recognize the true religion by which they are unmasked and vanquished. End of Book 7, Chapters 18-35 through 35. Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org